A lot of times, you know, before the service starts, you know, we are just, even sometimes when the service is started, prayer, worship and everything, you know, we are moving about, you know, people are giving high five and all that kind of thing. You don't find that kind of behavior when you go into Orthodox churches like the Catholic or Anglican. There is so much reverence in the building, you know. But we charismatics and Pentecostals, we tend to take God for granted, you know, because we think we know how to praise and worship, whatever, you know. But we don't have that reverence, and it's very shameful. I think that we need to be talking about these things more and more so that our attitude will change the way we worship in this place. Because we shouldn't think or fool ourselves that the way we do stuff here is the 100% way that God wants it to be. Absolutely not. We keep learning. We keep learning from the scriptures. The things that God requires of us so that we will conform to that standard. And so I hope that the scriptures today will help us to throw some light and understanding on the importance of observing, if you will, the Sabbath, which is our days of meeting, you know, uh, week after week. You know, you realize that on Sunday mornings, I don't know, the mindset is very important. If you wake up Sunday morning, the day that you have set to worship God in the gathering of the company of a family of believers, and we begin to prioritize other things other than preparing to come to church, I think the order is wrong. All of us have missed this, I believe, sometimes. You know, because sometimes you wake up in the morning on Sunday morning, service starts at 9, 10, 11, whatever it is. And we find ourselves doing things, loitering around the house and doing all kinds of things. And then we find ourselves running behind and we come late. And when we come late, we don't even get so absorbed in what is happening. It is like the body just shows up to announce that I'm here and that is it. It is just an outing. We forget that we have a responsibility and a commitment of God. And the way that we approach it is very important. You know, it breaks my heart, you know, that we do stuff like this all the time. It's like you forget that this is about God. And we take God for granted. And we, we just slow down. We do anything and anyhow. We drag ourselves, you know. But it's different when we're going to work, right? Or we have some engagement that is important to us. We like to really do everything and anything possible to make sure that we're there in time. There are people who are driven so much by how much money they can earn. And so every effort that they make is geared towards earning that income. That is all that they care about. Everything else does not matter. It's all about the money. And we all have different things that are important to us. Some people are so consumed about, you know, uh, what they are going to wear. Or how your home will look. You know, or your surroundings. You know, we, we, just, we just put emphasis on Certain things which we feel are important, by which considering God's commandments, really, really, it doesn't matter. Because it doesn't add any value to our worth. So I'm hoping that this morning, I'm saying this, you know, with a very heavy heart. And I'm praying that we'll have a change of attitude. And I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to let the scripture sp speak for itself. So that you can make your own decisions. You know, it's very important. Mark, Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. 
and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Amen. Jesus knows our frame. He understands the human existence, our psychology. The kind of pressures that we encounter in life. And so he addresses that issue by calling us to come to him. Because he has the answer to life's circumstances and problems and challenges. There are things that we all face on a regular basis. And some of these things can weigh very heavily on you. So he says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. You know, you can't let things that are happening in your life become so much weighty. So much so that you feel that you need to address them by your own strength or approach. And you can be so much consumed about the issues that coming to church doesn't become important to you. Because you feel that you need to fix that car. You need to go to work. or You need to do this. You need to do that. And so in the grand scheme of things, coming to worship really doesn't mean so much. Because you have become so familiar with it. That, oh yeah, I know what church is like. You just go, people pray and sing and you know yeah you know those things I, I know what it is after all i can even listen to the sermon you know later on on youtube etc etc and so we dismiss certain things and just get away with it but we don't know that we are actually depriving ourselves of intimacy with god our attitude is everything it's so important Jesus said there are burdens in this life. If you come to him, he says, I will give you rest. That word rest there is what is used in the Bible, Sabbath. S-A-B-B-A-T-H. Sabbath means to rest. Rest. What does rest mean? Rest means to rest from labor. To repose. To repose, you know. The picture that comes to my mind is like a dead body. Okay, when you go to any funeral and you find the dead body in the casket, he's just there still. He's not moving, nothing. He's just still. Everything is so serene. Okay? So, God is saying, I want you to just be calm in my presence. I want you to come into my presence and just relax. Don't let your mind be wandering. Okay? Rest from mental exertion. Things that are weighing on your mind. Let them go. Forget about them. All the troubles that you may be having on the job. For instance, for me, when I go to work, I deal with any issue that is happening there. As soon as I walk out of that building, I never re remember anything again in that building until I have to go back. I don't carry the burdens over there with me to the house. I, I don't do that. Hallelujah. I deal with it when I am there and I have to face it. But once it is over and I'm out, I'm out. Rest from mental exertion. The mind must be at rest when it ceases. To be disturbed or agitated. So you don't want to come to church and sit in church. And while you're sitting here. You are thinking about how you're going to deal with your husband when you go home. Or deal with your wife when you go home. You are thinking about what you are going to do. Or what you, you know, you're going to do next month. You are, you are so worried about it. And you are still sitting in church. Supposedly. In the presence of God. Please don't deceive yourself. When you come to church. This is a place to unwind. To just forget. 
close your mind to the things that are happening, whether it's at home, on the job, with your children, your finances, or anything. Forget about it and let your mind come home and focus on the throne of grace. The Bible says that is where we obtain help in a time of our need. Amen. Are you with me? He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And you shall find rest unto your souls. Jesus is, you know, looking upon us with a very, very, very gentle heart. He's very passionate about us. That is why he died for us. I'm sure you've watched the movie, The Passion of Christ. Look at the extent that he went in order to obtain our salvation for us. So his eyes are continually on us. We who have come to believe in his sacrifice. He says, I am with you. I am meek and lowly in heart. And you will find rest unto your souls. So part of the blessing of being born again, being a child of God, is to have that rest. That rest. You cease from labor. You are not struggling with the issues of life anymore. You are not allowing the matters of today or yesterday to weigh you down to the point where you cannot function. To the point where you cannot relate to your loved ones as you ought. He says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So if you apply the instruction that Jesus is offering for us to obey, if you apply them, if you do them, you're going to find that, oh wow, this is actually easy. When I take God and I make him my priority, it looks like he begins to take care of the things that used to bother me. Now I have my focus in the right place. I am not wandering to a fro. I want us to consider a passage in Genesis chapter 2, verse 1 to 3. It says, There's the heavens and the earth. We're finished, okay? That is very, very important to know that. The heavens and the earth. We're finished. God finished everything. And all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day. From all his work, which he has made. Amen. Amen. This is very important because God is bringing to us an image and a path that we also must take. Everything was finished. And when everything was finished, he rested on the seventh day. Verse 3. It says, and God blessed the seventh day. So the day that God has appointed as a day of rest, which is the Sabbath, is a day that God has blessed. So anybody who recognizes a day that you have set apart to worship God, to give him that recognition, know that some blessing is coming into your life and your family because you are doing it with the right attitude. He blessed the seventh day and sanctified it. He set it apart. So of the seven days, one day he has dedicated as a day of rest. A day when you remember God's goodness and mercies. A day when you know that God is trying to tell you that, look, everything that has to do with your life, it is finished. I have completed it. You don't need to carry any burden. Go back to verse 2 and look at that verse again. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. He ended it, which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Can you appreciate that verse? Can you appreciate what God is trying to communicate with us here? He finished it. 
everything. And on that seventh day, God made a choice. It is a choice that you and I have to make. A choice to let go of all our burdens and our worries. And bask in the presence of God. And allow his love to pour into us. Why do we have all kinds of promises in the Bible? Such as, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Why do we have scriptures like, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What, you know, why, what do these verses or scriptures, what, what, what meaning does it give to us at all? Is it just some kind of thing we parrot? Or do we understand these covenant promises? And are we just looking at it with our eyes? Or are we believing with our heart as well? To believe with your heart means that you are taking the action, the step. You know, to behave like what is being presented in the word to you. Verse 3 says, and what? God blessed the seventh day. Oh my God. God blessed that day that he set aside. He blessed it. And he sanctified it. Sanctified means he set it apart. It made, he made it holy. Special. Because that in it, he had rested from all his work which God created. And he made. Hallelujah. It is important that as Christians, we must come to a place of rest in Christ. It's very important. We cannot be like the rest of the world. Where we are running like chicken without a head. You know, like people without hope. God has given us hope. God has given us hope. That is why even in the face of this pandemic, you cannot allow the signs to determine your final, you know, understanding about where you, your life will be tomorrow. God is life. Stay in God and he will keep you alive all the time. Hallelujah. Recognize him. Let a sign say what he's want to, they want to say. If you read the book of 1 John, it says that if we accept the witness of man, the witness of God is greater. Hallelujah. And so signs can say what they want. But hey, God says that I am the Lord that healeth thee. He said he sent his word and he healed them from all their diseases. So we hold on to that word and we confess it. And we don't let any of the things that is being said, no fear, no fear. Many, many times the Bible tells us, fear not for I am with thee. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will uphold you. Etc. Etc. Jeremiah chapter 17. Verse 21 to 25. It says, Thus says the Lord, Take heed to yourselves, and bear no burden on the Sabbath day. You see? On the day that you have decided that you are going to worship God. Don't carry your problems with you. Don't do that. Don't get so caught up in the issues that is happening in the house. Oh, maybe the stove is not working. Or this, I mean, so you just become so worked up. And a, whole, a lot of times in Christian homes on Sunday morning, that is the time that there is a lot of fighting. It is so sad. That is how the enemy has succeeded in penetrating the household. But we have to defeat this work through the cross of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. He says, that says the Lord. Who is speaking? God is speaking. He says, take heed to yourself. And be careful. And bear no burden on the Sabbath day. Nor bring it. In by the gates of Jerusalem. Don't carry your problem. And let it weigh on your mind. So that when you come into the presence of God. You cannot worship God. You cannot release yourself. To worship God. Verse 
verse 22. Neither carry forth a burden out of your houses on the Sabbath day. Huh? Don't carry burdens, problems. As though you are the only one who has problems in this world. Don't do that. Neither do any work, but hallow ye the Sabbath. That is, make the Sabbath a holy day. Treat it as a very special day that you have dedicated to worship God. Let it be seen in your attitude because God always is reading our heart from afar. Since man looks on the outside, okay, so you can come to church, come through this door and sit here. But the things that you did in the house to your husband, your children, or your wife, the things that came out of your mouth, your attitude before you got here, God has already seen it. I have not seen, but God has seen it. Okay? Let us stop that behavior because we cannot fool God. He says, don't carry your burden out of the houses on the Sabbath day, the day that you have set aside to worship God. Don't do that. And don't do any work. Okay? So that is not the day on Sunday when you are supposed to come and worship God. That is the day people want to do the most work before they come to work, before they come to church. It should be the reverse. Do the work after you have come to worship God. Let us set it in the right order. But hallow ye the Sabbath as I commanded your fathers. Now, don't be sitting here and thinking in your mind, we don't, celebrate, we don't observe the Sabbath anymore. We do. Jesus said, I did not come to void the commandments. I came to fulfill it. This is wisdom. This is something that is very, very precious that you need to give consideration. Okay? He says, hallow it. Just like I commanded your fathers. Verse 23. But they obeyed not, neither inclined their ear, but made their neck stiff, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. In fact, somewhere, I think is it in Corinthians, Paul says something in regard to the Israelites when they were in the wilderness. He says that they did not, they were so stubborn, and because of that, all they were concerned about is to eat the manna, the food. Okay? He says, let us eat, let us drink. They, they ate and drank and rose up to play. That's all they were concerned about. Okay, so you come to church, you come through the door, and everybody, hey, high five, hey, yeah, this, we are all doing this thing. And we come into the service, everything starts, and still we are moving about, and everybody is just so casual. There is nothing in your attitude that shows that, hey, I am afraid of God. Nothing. So every, we, we just, oh, the worst part is when somebody comes to church, and you have your cell phone with you. And you are going about. And you are checking messages. Oh my God. That is an insult to God. It's better you don't come to church at all. It's very, very, very bad habit. Very, very, extremely bad habit. You can say that I'm reading my Bible. Well, I don't know how disciplined you are. That when you are here, and you are strictly... Just reading the scriptures on your phone. Because these phones have a way of just interfering anytime. They obeyed not. They did not incline their ear, but they made the neck stiff, stubborn, that they might not hear nor receive instruction. 24. And it shall come to pass. If you diligently hearken unto me, says the Lord, to bring in no burden through the gates of this city on the Sabbath day, but hallow the Sabbath day to do no work therein, 25, then shall there enter into the gates of this city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots 
and on the horses. They and their princes, the men of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And this city shall remain forever. Amen. I know specifically it's talking to the Israelites. But the same principles can be applied to the church today. If we do it right, God is going to make sure that you ride in the high places. He's going to bring about victories in your life that you have not even fought for. He is going to make sure that those th situations are resolved for us. Hallelujah. Let us think about obedience. Okay? Our obedience is not just restricted to when we became born again. Okay? When you confess Jesus, our obedience doesn't end there. We need to find out the things that God is asking of us so that we can give it to him. So that God will be so pleased with us. Remember, he spoke concerning Jesus. He says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Oh my God, can, that, can God say the same thing of us? Each one of us, can God? I don't know. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Lack of faith does not profit us. Okay? When you don't have faith in God's word, then you, your Christianity is going to be dry. But you have, if you have confidence in God's word and you practice it, it will bring blessings. Hallelujah. And so, listen carefully. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1 says, Let us therefore fear, lest the promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should seem to come short of it. Okay? Verse 2. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. So you can see that any time God's word is preached, for it to benefit you, you got to apply faith. Okay? Faith is also the same thing as believe. To believe means that you embrace it and you are prepared to act on what you are being told. You are going to act on it just as it's said. Hallelujah. That's all there is to it. But the thing about faith is that a lot of times our mind struggles because we try to reason it out. Because the thinking of God is not actually the way man thinks. Okay? So when God tells us something, a lot of times we, he, we look at it and say, ah, man, what, what is this? You know, it, it's very strange. But if you come to embrace God's word as the final authority in your life, you give it everything that is inside of you to see what God will do by your obedience. Hallelujah. It did not profit them because they did not mix the message they received with faith. Verse 3. For we which have believed, or those of us who exercise faith, we do enter into rest. As he said. Hallelujah. So for instance, if he's saying that don't bring your problems to the place of worship. Don't, don't. Now, it is very important to understand there's a dis distinction, you know. Because when we read the Bible, we see that in the church or in the synagogue, there were people with problems. Okay? But what we are trying to say here is that you don't allow the issues of your life to take away your mind from focusing on God. And then you are using your own strength to try to resolve those issues in your life. Instead of, you know, leaving them alone and coming to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It says, for we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath. If they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundations of the world. Remember chapter 2 of Genesis? The works were finished. They were finished. Everything that concerns your life, God has already solved it. So, all that you need to do is to believe. And not to panic. Verse 4. 
For he spake in a certain place of the seventh day on this wise. Okay. So again, the seventh day is very important. That is the day that the Bible refers to as Sabbath. Okay. It's the day of rest. He spake concerning the seventh day on this wise. And God did rest the seventh day from all his works. God wants you to do the same. And in this place again. If they shall enter into my rest. Verse 6. Seeing therefore it remains. That some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached. Entered not in because of what? Unbelief. Okay. Unbelief is a very very dangerous enemy. Seeing therefore. It remained that some must enter therein. And they to whom it was first preached. Entered not. They entered not. They entered not. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But if you don't come, you don't get that rest. Okay? Because of what? Unbelief. Next verse. Again, he limited a certain day, saying, In David, today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Eight, for if Jesus had given them rest, then will he not afterward have spoken of another day. We know that in the wilderness, you know, those who were, you know, redeemed from Egypt, only few were able to make it into the promised land. Very few of the original crop. But the rest was the descendants, their sons and daughters, that they live it, you know, in the wilderness. Okay, God gave them the opportunity, but they missed it. The Bible says that they did not mix the message with faith. So they lost that opportunity. They didn't get into that rest that God wanted them to. Because they were always, what, whining. They were complaining. They were agitated. And because of that, God brought judgment on them in the wilderness. You know, at one point, God had to open the ground. And 30,000 people were just buried just like that instantly. Man, that is very shocking. You know, let's go on. There remains, therefore, a rest to the people of God. There remains. There is a rest that you need to enter. You need to come to a place where your Christianity is more than just words. Where you begin to believe God. To take care of the burdens of your life. Somebody is hurting you. And you are trying to deal with it by your own strength. Leave it alone. Give it into the hands of God. Enter God's rest. Let the peace of God which passes all understanding. Protect your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. Let God take care of it. And see what God will do. Hallelujah. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. There is a rest. God has reserved that for you. But you are not entering it because you don't believe that God can do it. And you are trying to solve it with your own strength. Verse 10. For he that is entered into his rest, that is the rest of God, he also has ceased from his own works as God did from his. Okay? When you begin to apply these principles, God is saying that now, you have entered into his rest. You don't allow issues of life to worry you to the extent where you just can't sleep. Please. <sighs> if you are in this church and you cannot sleep, please. Think about why you cannot sleep. Huh? If you are, I mean, sometimes some people will be tired and, you know, because of that they cannot sleep. But if you cannot sleep just because of the worries of this life. Then your quality of life in Christ. Is questionable. Sleep like a baby. In the presence of God. Hallelujah. That's what the Bible says. It says it makes my beloved sleep. Verse 11. Let us labor therefore. To enter into that rest. Lest any man fall. After the same example. Of unbelief. I think it speaks for itself. Hallelujah. 
Oh, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You know, there is so much wisdom in this Sabbath, you know, discussion or whatever, you know. It's, you know, we are not practicing the law. We are not saying that on the Sabbath day you only travel two miles. You know, we are not putting do's and don'ts on anybody. What we are talking about here is our attitude towards God. If we have set this day aside as a day we want to serve God, we better do it with all that is within us. Remember the first commandment. You will love the Lord your God. First, this is the second commandment. I think that is the second commandment. With all your heart, your soul, your strength, your neighbors, yourself. Hallelujah. The first one, there's God, one God. There's no other God but him. So, what is the essence of this Sabbath thing we're talking about? Exodus chapter 31 will be done very shortly. Exodus chapter 31, verse 14. It says, you shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Okay? Is, do you consider Sundays when we come here? Do you find this as a very important day in your life? When I come home from work, like I did this morning, and I have to rush to work, up to church, I, I don't feel any pressure at all. It gives me joy. Because I know that this is my life. And this is my God. So I do it with joy and gladness. Hallelujah. It shouldn't feel like somebody is punishing you like it's a chore. You shall keep the Sabbath therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. Okay? That is the law. That means <laughs> you'll be killed. But I believe that another interpretation you can give to this is that you become spiritually weak. Because if you don't apply the right attitude, that means that you are lacking and not receiving the full blessing of God when you come into this sanctuary. And so you come week after week and you go. But you are not finding completeness in your life spiritually. Examine yourself. This is not because of the sermons that are being preached. It's not because it may be because of you yourself, your attitude. Examine yourself and see how you are coming to this place with your heart and your mind. How? Because God sees the heart, right? He sees the heart. We don't see, but God sees it. So he says, the one who does not honor the Sabbath, he dies. Okay? And we know that right now, because God, we are not practicing the old law where you are going to be killed physically, you know, but, you know, spiritually... There's going to be some death. For whosoever doeth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. And I've seen this happen so many times in my Christian journey. Where people don't give God the first place in their life. And so they come, it's like taking two steps forward. And then they take five steps backwards. You see, they're always cycling. Cycling, cycling. Because they don't take God seriously. You know, God is not a magician. God is God. And you need to relate to him as somebody, you know, he's an intelligent being. He has emotions. You need to relate to him. Know that, you know, you care about him. Verse 15. Six days may work be done. But in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest. Holy to the Lord. Whosoever doeth any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Now, I want to make it very clear. You know, we are not under the law anymore. Okay? So, don't, we are not here to tell ourselves do's and don'ts. Because we know that in this society, you know, uh, some people work weekends. Like I'm working this week. I'm going back to work tonight. Okay? 
So if I want to literally follow this, it would mean that I don't have to go to work. But that is not what the Bible is saying. What the Bible is saying is that set your priorities right. And if you dedicate a day for God, give him 100%. Give him 100%. Don't make it like some kind of child game. Give God your whole heart. Because God sees our heart. Some people will be in bed and, yeah, I, you know, hey, I, I, look. Zoom is a good thing. But don't let Zoom be everything for you. I think there's a big difference when you observe and participate in this service from afar on a screen versus being here when we are all together. There's nothing wrong observing from afar, but I'm just telling you. There's, there's a, it's a different feel. Hallelujah. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is a time of rest. Make it holy unto the Lord. Unto who? The Lord. Whosoever doeth any work on the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. Okay, I've explained that already. 16. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout what? Their generations for a perpetual covenant. So there is no end to this. Okay, God wants to see this throughout the generations. And we have become what? A new generation, the royal priesthood. We have been grafted into that tree. We were once outside this, but God brought us inside. So I believe in my heart that if we are going to have a relationship with God, if we are going to set a day aside as a day of worship, let us show with our attitude. That we really care about our God. And let us do it beautifully. Hallelujah. Verse 17. It is, it is a sign. Okay, When you do these things. That God is asking us to do. Then it is a sign between me. And the children of Israel. Forever. A sign. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth. And on the seventh day. He rested. And was refreshed. <laughs> Hallelujah. So you can see that when we practice this appropriately, rest comes into our lives. God brings some rest that is beyond even what the mind can imagine. Your burdens will all just kind of ease away. It doesn't mean that there are not problems. There are problems, but God is bearing them up for you. You are not carrying those things by yourself. It refreshes you. What good is it if you come to church and you go home still the same, not feeling different? It's not good. It's a sign. If you practice this, let's go to Matthew chapter 12. I want to read this quickly, 13 verses, and I think after that I have one more, and we'll take the communion, please. Matthew chapter 12, verse 1 through 13. At that time, Jesus went on the Sabbath day through the corn and his disciples were on hungry you know and began to pluck the corns the ears of corn and to eat let's go on but when Pharisees saw it they said unto him behold thy disciples do that which is not lawful to do upon the Sabbath day but he said to them have you not read what David did when he was unhungry and they that were with him how he entered into the house of God and did eat the shoe bread, which was not lawful for him to eat, neither for them which were with him, but only for the priest? Or have you not read in the law how that on the Sabbath days the priest in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? But I say unto you that in this place okay, is one greater than the temple. He's talking about himself now. Hallelujah. I want you to understand this. I brought this passage. It's very long, but I want to read everything so that you get the perspective that Christ is trying to present here. He says that there is one who is in this place and is greater than the temple. That's Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's go on. Verse 7. But if 
you had known what is what this means what i'm telling you now that there's somebody here who is greater than the temple if only you understood what i'm trying to tell you i will have mercy and not sacrifice okay i will have mercy and not what sacrifice so it's not you showing up that god is looking up but he's looking at your attitude okay so you may have real problems and we all do one way or the other but if you don't come with the right attitude that problem will keep staying there for you forever you'll be praying but there'll be no answers but if you have the right attitude god will have mercy on you god will have mercy on you hallelujah he says i will have mercy and not sacrifice you will not have condemned the guiltless there's eight for the son of man is lord even of the sabbath day and when he was departed thence he went into the synagogue which they which are called the church right he went to the church so let, let's look at what happened and behold there was a man which had his hand withered okay so in the church there was this man his hand, hand was withered one was shorter than the other it has shrunk and and they asked him saying is it lawful to heal on the sabbath days that he might accuse him so they were looking for opportunity to accuse jesus but look at what jesus did and he said unto them what man shall there be among you that shall have one sheep and if it fall into a pit on the sabbath day will he not lay hold on it and lift it up how much then is a man better than a sheep wherefore it is lawful to do well on the sabbath days hallelujah so jesus is bringing the idea here that look on the sabbath day it is not so much about you just appearing but he's looking at your heart your attitude he, he wants to show mercy if you recognize him as the lord of the sabbath as the reason why you come to this place ah god's mercy will really visit you in your situations hallelujah verse 13 says that then said he to the man stretch forth thy hand and he stretched it forth and it was restored just like the other just like that mercy hallelujah you know the people were so much concerned about do this and do that jesus said no that's not it just because you saw my disciples plucking the ears of corn to eat, you think that they are breaking the law. No, no. I have come to change the order. It is about mercy. Come to God with the right attitude. And he will heal you. He will bless you. Hallelujah. Verse 14 says, Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against him, how they might destroy him. 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. 16. And he charged them that they should not make him known. 17. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, What? Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles. Hallelujah. When we come to God with the right attitude, Jesus, Jesus who God has anointed will show up in our midst. In that synagogue, Jesus appeared in the synagogue. That man had no clue. He had no idea the miracle that was going to come to him that day. But Jesus showed up. And his arm was straightened. I believe that if we come into God's presence, not thinking about our problems, God knows, Jesus knows how he will show up. Manifest himself, his glory in your life. Without you even having any idea about it. Oh, God is merciful. Hallelujah. Finally. Let's read Isaiah chapter 58, verse 13 and 14. If you read the whole chapter, he's talking about the Israelites 
They were complaining that we have prayed, we have prayed, we have cried, we have fasted. But God is not doing anything. It's like nothing is happening in their lives and they were just worried. They were concerned why God was not answering their prayers. And if you read it down, you know, you find a lot of things that you can counsel yourself with. But I just want to focus on verse 13 and 14, the last two verses. It says that if you turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, okay, and when I read this, what it's actually saying is like, you know, what it's actually meaning there is um, if, you, if you don't trample the Sabbath, okay, the day that you're supposed to set aside to worship God, if you don't treat it with contempt, okay, that is what he's trying to say. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, in other words, if you don't treat the Sabbath or the days that we come to worship with contempt and you treat it anyhow, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day and call the Sabbath a delight. This is where my title is coming from. Call the Sabbath a delight. So if coming to church is so important and you have come to value it and cherish it and God is seeing you that you are coming into this place ready to worship, and your attitude is indicating. I believe that the time that we should be fooling around is after church where you know, everything is over. But when we are coming in, everybody must have that kind of sovereign attitude. Because you, you, you want to just be able to come and give honor to God. Because look at, look at the things that are stated over there. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing your pleasure on that holy day, okay? And you call the Sabbath a delight. The holy of the Lord. Honorable. Do you find Sundays honorable? Okay. It's not about man. It's about God. So those of you who constantly set this place up for us to come and worship. I believe that God must touch your heart in a certain way that you are making this sacrificially. Week after week. Coming to sweep. Pick up paper. Those who come to practice everything, you know, set up this play, all shares. I mean, a week after week. If you find this honorable and you are doing it with your heart, there is blessing for you. Hallelujah. And shall honor him, that is Jesus, not doing your own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, okay? Nor speaking thine own words. 14, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. And I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth. And feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen. Very simply, God is saying that if you honor him on the Sabbath days, on the days that you have set. Remember the Sabbath day is supposed to be a day of rest. And that rest is like. You have seized from that mental exertion. Where uh, you, you have just. Shut everything out. You just want to dedicate and give it to God. And you want to worship him. Okay. So that is an act of faith. And that is what pleases God. Without faith it is impossible to please God. So just that action in itself. One step. Then number two is that there is attitude of reverence. You, there is holiness. That if you keep that day holy and not do your pleasure. That's why I'm saying that on Sundays, don't try to occupy yourself with so many things that you deem to be important in your house before you come to church. If anything, do them the night before. And on, the, that, on that day in the morning, let everything just be that you want to be here in time. Okay, let us try to practice it. I believe that it will bring a lot of commendation from God. And then finally, he says that let God be your delight. That means when you come here, be happy. Be happy, rejoice. Clap your hands when you are singing the songs. Raise your hands and just thank God. You know, if you have to bow down on your knees, do that. You want to run to and fro and just thank God, just praise his holy name. He says, if you do these things, I'll cause you to ride 
in your high places. In other words, God is going to bring promotion in your life. He will make sure that the things that he has said concerning your life, they are fulfilled. May God give us understanding. May God give us wisdom. May God give us the grace to embrace this knowledge and to practice, practice it or them, whatever, so that we can enjoy more blessings from the throne of grace. Hallelujah. We want to exalt your name, O oh Lord, because you reign and rule supreme. That with you, O oh Lord, nothing is impossible. That you are the Lord, the God of all flesh. That there is nothing that is beyond you. So we bless you and thank you. And acknowledge your supremacy over our lives. As we are living, O oh Father, we pray to you, O God Almighty, that you bring to understanding, O oh Lord, your way. That we will grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord our God, that will be firmly established in your word, knowing that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, or anything present, past, or future will be able to separate us from your love because of your grace and your covenant through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we ask you, o Lord Almighty, that you bless us and keep us. Make your face shine upon us and be gracious unto us. Father, that you help us that we dwell in peace. May your glory be with us. In Jesus' name, amen.